Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat in which we will discuss passive activity loss limits and at-risk limits. To understand the passive activity loss rules and the at-risk limitation, it's very important to put those into a historical context. Why did they come into place? We'll have to go back to the 1980s, specifically before 1986, when tax shelters were a common thing. Also in the 1980s, interest rate was high in contrast to now, and we had something called ACRES, Accelerated Cost Recovery System. It's a depreciation method, and it's called ACRES for a reason. It's accelerated. Now, 1986 going forward, we started to use makers, and this is what you learn about now, modified accelerated. Modified, it slowed down the depreciation early on. So given this background, here's what was happening back in the mid-80s. You have people that are generating W-2 income or business income, and here's what they would do. For example, you will take a doctor, a lawyer, and another doctor, just for the sake of illustration. Well, they will do, they will decide to buy a strip mall and rent it out. And each individual, for the sake of illustration, will invest 30000 in equity. So in overall, they contributed $90,000, 90K altogether. Then they borrowed 910000 Therefore, they have a business of a million dollars. They started the business and they deduct. Now they're going to rent this place and they are going to deduct depreciation because we have acres early on. It's going to have a lot of depreciation and the interest on the loan. Between the depreciation on the interest, they're going to be generating losses. From those losses, they will go ahead and reduce their W-2 income, income from other activities. So basically what they were doing, they were buying deductions. And this is basically a form of a tax shelter. Another example, in year one, Ryan earned a salary of 350000 as the CEO of Farhat Company and a dividend income of 12000 he also made an investment of 35000 for a 10% ownership interest in a partnership. For year one, the partnership reported a loss of 740000 Now, Ryan's share of the loss is 74000 What would happen under those circumstances if there are no loss limitation? What is the effect of this partnership loss on Ryan's income tax return? Well, Ryan would realize a 74 thousand times the tax rate in one year only. Now let's assume for the sake of illustration, the tax rate is 25%. So if we take 74,000 times 0.25, he would realize 18,500 in tax savings in one year from this partnership because there is no limitation. To combat those abuses, what the government did, they introduced the at-risk limit rule and you are limited also to your tax basis limitation. Simply put, you are, your, your deduction will be limited to the amount at risk. And we'll talk about what that is shortly. It's the amount that you are at risk of losing and or your tax basis. What are your tax basis? Usually, the at risk and the tax basis are the same, but the at risk limit might exclude, will exclude certain re non-recourse liabilities, which we'll talk about those shortly. Also, the government introduced the passive activity loss rule, which segregate your income into three buckets. So your income now will have to be either classified as active, passive, or portfolio income. Now we need to discuss those three buckets. But before we discuss those three income buckets, I would like to make an announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. No obligation, no credit card required. So here are the three buckets. The first one is active income. What is considered active income? From the word active, it means you are working for it. An income that's generated by the taxpayer through active engagement in a specific activity. Think about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. That's your active income. The most common example will be a W-2 salary and wages. It could be guarantee payments. It could be business income from activities in which the taxpayer materially participate. And this is important. It's a business, 
but the taxpayer materially participate. Now, what does materi materially participate mean? We're going to have a whole session discussing, but simply put, it means the taxpayer is actively engaged in the activity on a, on a regular and continuous basis. And we'll talk about this later. Don't worry about this. Portfolio income. It's basically investment income. It will include capital gains, interest income, dividend income, annuity income, royalty income. Basically, those are portfolio or investment income. Passive income. Passive income is, is an income from any trade or income producing activity. Hold on. It sounds like this one here in which the taxpayer does not materially participate. And notice the here, not materi materially participate. So if that doctor and lawyer that we talked about early on did not, did not run the business, did not rent all that shopping center, made the decision, was there on regular basis, invested certain amount of hours, which we'll talk about all the details later, then they cannot take this loss against this income. That's it. So passive losses are separate than active income, separate than portfolio income. Also, it's worth noting that any working interest in an oil or gas property in which the form of ownership does not limit the owner's liability is also excluded. Just FYI, know it in case you have a CPA question about this. Now, let's talk about the tax basis limitation. But simply put, we have to know what is the basis. This tax basis limit the amount of the loss that a partner, an S, an S shareholder, or an LLC member can pass to, to to its individual income tax. So I, you are limited to your tax basis. What is your tax basis? How much you basically invested in the company? What's your capital? That's basically what, what a basis is. In fact, the deduction of the loss is limited to the taxpayer initial investment in a flow-through entity adjusted for items such as income, deduction, distribution, and that as appropriate. Now, bear in mind, we will be discussing in greater details tax basis because different entities will have slightly different tax bases, like a partnership will be a little bit different than an S corporation. But for now, we could have a general idea about how to compute tax basis. As a general idea, we compute tax basis through the amount of cash and adjusted basis of property contributed. Simply put, if you invested in a company, if you invested money, your basis, your capital is starting to accumulate. If you contributed property, the adjusted basis of your property is added. Any amount, the, the amount borrowed by the entity for which the taxpayer, notice I highlighted in yellow, personally liable or has pledged a property that's not used in the business. So you pledged a property as a security to get a loan and it's not used in the business. Well, guess what? If that's the case, it gets added to your basis. And if it gets added to your basis, it allows you to deduct, you remember, the, the losses against it. Amount of non-recourse liability, non-recourse liability, including qualified non-recourse liability that are borrowed for the use in the activities. What is non-recourse? What is recourse and non-recourse? Recourse liabilities is when the own, the, the lender, the lender uh, can come back and take your personal property, home, vehicle, a personal boat, whatever you have, they have a recourse against you. Non-recourse liabilities, that's it. You borrow the money. If something happened, too bad. The lender cannot take away anything from you. So amount of non-recourse liabilities, including qualified non-recourse liability that are borrowed for the use and the activity, that's added. Now, just make a note of this. Remember this. We're going to discuss it later on. Also, any share of the activities income add to your basis, any share of the loss is reduced, reduce your basis. And obviously, if you withdraw money, it's the opposite of contributing money. It's going to reduce your basis. So you need to know what increases your basis, what increases your basis. Because remember, your losses are limited to your basis. So this is an idea about your basis. Also, your losses are limited to your at-risk limit. At-risk limit is the second limitation that applies to the deduction. It's the amount of the taxpayer economic investment in the activity. Okay? In other words, it represents the economic risk to which the taxpayer is exposed. How much are you exposed at? To compute the at-risk amount, well, it's very easy. We'll take the tax basis less his share or her share of the entity's non-recourse liabilities. Remember, I kept emphasizing this non-recourse, I said amount of non-recourse, because when you compute the at-risk amount, you will take out th that non-recourse, non because it does not 
it it's less no, notice it's your tax basis less your share of non-recourse liability it's also important to emphasize that recourse liabilities increase your tax basis we already saw this and increase your at-risk basis so make sure you, you differentiate between recourse and non-recourse recourse because they can come after you they have a recourse against you then it should be considered at risk because you are risking your personal asset you are risking your personal wealth therefore you are at risk however non-recourse liabilities again i'm repeating this more than once increases your basis not your at-risk amount so make sure you know this also there's an exception an exception applied to the non-recourse liability that are secured by real property or qualified non-recourse liability which increases the tax basis as well as at risk basis of the taxpayer so if it's a qualified non-recourse you should be good to go and what's a qualified non-recourse Li uh, liabilities that are secured by real property if that's the case it's a qualified non-recourse because they can take the property how to compute the at-risk basis again very similar we'll start by the amount of cash and the adjusted basis of the property contributed to the activity amount borrowed for the use in the activity for which the taxpayer is personally liable or has pledged as a security a property not used in the activity that's also increases your at-risk basis amount borrowed for the use and the activity that are qualified non-recourse only qualified that means there's it's against re real property it's against notice here what we said it's against secured by real property also any income will increase the at-risk amount any share of income and any share of loss would reduce the at-risk amount obviously also if the if the taxpayer withdraw money from the activity it's going to reduce the basis so what's the difference between the at risk and <clears throat> the basis is the non-recourse liability now a loss and access of the taxpayer at risk basis is suspended until the at risk basis is reinstated how would it be reinstated you will either contribute more money to the to the to the business contributed property uh, you have to borrow money in which you are personally uh, liable or the business will generate more income it can it can be coro it can be carried forward indefinitely when the taxpayer dispose get rid of this of his or her ownership any suspended loss due to the at risk limitation can be deducted from the gain realized from the sale of the interest so you can deduct this if there's any gain on that sale on the sale of the business let's look at an example to illustrate the concept and keep it simple for now at the beginning of the current year peter invested 32000 for a 50 percent ownership in pj partnership the partnership reported income of 50000 for year end and distributed 2000 to each partner determine peter's at risk basis by the end of the year well the solution will be look something like this the initial investment of 32 peter's share of the partnership income of 25000 minus the withdrawal of 20,000 so at risk amount is 55,000 now it's important to note here that this is a simple example and Peter's tax basis equal to his at risk basis because partnership has neither a recourse nor a non-recourse we don't care about recourse but we worry about non-recourse we don't have to worry about this so we're keeping it simple what should you do now go to Farhat lectures and work MCQs true false that's going to help you understand this topic further now I'm going to be talking a little bit more about passive activity income passive activity losses what what, what constitute material participation so just keep going keep working with this you need to understand it so you will succeed whether in your course or CPA exam good luck study hard and stay safe